Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's joining us today. Um, I am Shahida from the Singapore Art Museum, and I'm pleased to welcome you all to tonight's uh, online event, uh, Tan Mahil, an online performance by Suzanne Kai, which will start very soon. Um, this event, the third episode in the series, is held in conjunction with Sam's Skill Futures, a digital commissioning platform consisting of performances, workshops, and lectures that elaborate on the balances of intelligence issuing from mining histories by inviting artistic practices that consider the screen as a speculative medium of the future. I hope these are ideas that interest you as much as it does for us, so do look out for incoming programs as part of the series. Moving on, I'd like to quickly introduce our guests that we're um, our guests and what we're expecting from the performance theater. So Kite, aka Suzanne Kite, is a Oklahoma Lakota performance artist, visual artist, and composer raised in Southern California with a BFA from Cal Arts in Music Composition and MFA from Bard College Milton Avery Graduate School, and is a PhD candidate at Concordia University. Her scholarship and practice investigate contemporary Lakota ontologies through research creation, computational media, and performance. Recently, Kai has been developing a body interface for movement performances, carbon fiber sculptures, immersive video, and sound installations, as well as co running the experimental electronic imprint Unheard Records. Her work has been featured in various publications, including the American Indian Culture and Research Journal, um, the, uh, the Journal of Design and Science under MIT Press, which includes the award winning article Making Kin with Machines, published in 2018. In today's performance titled Tan Mahil, Kite will be sharing with us a visual score, a form of experimental music notation that derives from traditional Lakota art making, where processes of visual score reading are reflected in a quill work and beat work geometric designs and translated for the aftermath of a waking or sleeping dream. Similarly to reading and writing music, these designs communicate concepts without verbal language, becoming a semiotic language, a language of symbols that do not have to be explained. Like stories, their meaning changes over time and develops over a lifetime, no longer confined to its original interpretation. In this performance, Kai will assign visions to symbols, weaving a complete graphic score into being, creating a dream narrative from a collection of visions reenacted through videos. Thank you all again for joining us. I would also like to advise you that there will be loud sounds, so feel free to adjust your volumes accordingly. There may also be unintended glitches that may arise from technical issues, so do be patient with us. Please also stick around after the performance where Kai will share more about her practice and we'll have a Q&A session. You can submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the video screen. And if you're viewing this on a mobile device, the Q&A function can be found right below this video. Do feel free to submit your comments or thoughts as you go along. And without further ado, I, I'll let to hand over to our main guest for the session. Kai, the screen is yours. Mm. and come back now. Someone here is waving a shawl at me. Cousin, come back now. Someone here is waving a shawl at me. Look at their tracks. Someone here is waving a shawl at me. Cousin, come back now. Someone here is waving a shawl at me.
I'm not dreaming, I'm awake. My brain splits open from stress. I'm 15 years old, an advanced placement, European history. My friends are bullying me, but I'm too eager for their love. A thought reoccurs to me again and again and again. It is my foot chained to the ceiling. I am about 16 years old. I have a reoccurring thought. I want to scratch my head. Scratch my head till it bleeds. I scratch my back to clear my mind. I'm 31 years old. I am ungraspably lonely sometimes, so I rub my socks together and pretend I'm laying next to another human. I'm 32 years old, and my boyfriend won't tell me he loves me. Out from somewhere, somewhere deep, a song emerges as a question. Do you love me? 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 
With every drip of doubt, the song emerges. I ask a grandmother who hovers very closely to my head, the crown of my head. I've begun to sit with my own chi, my grandmother's 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 grandmother. She sits with me, but she's in the mirror world. She's in the mirror world, and the crowns of our heads just barely touch. I ask her, do you love me, Unchi? Do you love me? 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 The theoretical framework that I'm thinking through centers on three previously unarticulated concepts. Lakota artwork as embodied knowledge making, Lakota geometry as a semiotic language, and a cosmology scape as an ethical ontological sphere. Within my community, Lakota communities, these frameworks are commonly practiced theoretical methodological frames for creating, articulating, and moving Lakota philosophical knowledge and the Lakota lived experience. From the mundane to the sacred and the blurred in between, I want to articulate a theoretical framework for understanding the agency of non-humans such as stones through the writings of anthropologists like Philip Edescola and David C. Posthumus to express in writing the fraction of the teachings of my maternal grandfather, Mahpia Najin, Standing Cloud, or Bill Stover. I articulate a theoretical framework for body-centered acts of creation through the writings of artist Jolene Ricard and writer Jim Cheney, providing context for the interviews of singer Sievert Youngbear Sr., who articulates a clear relationship between the body and Lakota knowledge-making. Finally, I articulate a framework for a Lakota semiotic language, drawing from the work of Lakota designer Sadie Redwing, who has created this design methodology for Lakota geometric symbols. It is impossible to express Lakota knowledge without these body-centered acts of creation. The inseparability of mind and body and the links between creative practice and knowledge production require the artistic collaborative methodology as a fundamental approach to this research. This theoretical framework is central to the other two frameworks as well. Lakota artworks are dreamed through the body, made with the body, interpreted with the body, worn on the body. Lakota cosmology scape is understood as perspective of the world seen through the body and generated through the relationship between one's physical body and one's spiritual awareness in relation to the land and cosmos. I have developed this theoretical framework through research into the connection between Lakota ontology and artificial intelligence drawing on Lakota beliefs that humans can develop ethical and reciprocal relationships with seemingly inanimate objects. However, ontology and beinghood are only one small piece of the microcosmic and macrocosmic Lakota philosophic construct, which most importantly centers the reinterpretation and the open lines of communication between the spirit world and the people, allowing for the constant growth of knowledge over time. Lakota knowledge creation methodologies such as ceremony, singing, storytelling, discussion, speech making are body centered acts of creation. Body centered acts such as performance art, machine learning are only possible through the methodologies of a research creation that establishes how knowledge production can not only include other artistic methodologies but collaborative as well. The fundamental approach to pursuing research in indigenous communities and across human and non-human beings. Lakota ideas of being and personhood are vastly different from colonial definitions, offering us the epistemological exit from destructive and exploitive relationships with non-humans, including artificial intelligence. Lakota ontologies see interiority in our more than human relations 
and those interiorities are located and contextualized in the cosmology scape. Indigenous performance art and sound artwork directly inscribe the body into this cosmology scape using physical tools such as the proposed objectives of wearables or art performance or dance or singing. According to Siebert Younger Sr., a very important Lakota uh, singer, the most earth-shaking way of transmitting knowledge, he says, song and dance can't really be separated. Even though I'll talk about one or the other, they're always connected. We never dance without singing and we rarely sing without dancing. The involvement of the whole body to us is part of the balance we look for in our lives. The body and voice are there along with the mind and the heart. The view of the inseparability of body and voice is central to this Lakota creation and transmission and therefore required for the formation of arts, ideas, and research. These Lakota methods have a process by which one can understand Lakota metaphysical semiotics and communicate knowledge back to my community in an appropriate method. Regarding the body and wearables, I turn to Lakota holy man, George Sword, who directly addresses the animacy and agency of the shaman's outfit around the turn of the century. He says, quote, but the secrets of the shamans I am afraid to write, for I have my old outfit as a shaman, and I'm afraid to offend it. If a shaman offends his ceremonial outfit, it will bring, bring disaster upon him, end quote. This quote has had a powerful effect on my understandings of non-human agency and seemingly man-made objects. The outfit is created by a human made of parts of the non-human, non-humans which we have covenants and long-standing relationships like bison, deer, plant beings. Through collaboration with those physical non-humans and non-humans in the spirit world, the outfit contains agency with which it can physically and spiritually influence the human world with powerful agency. Wearables as technologies and artworks, whether they use machine learning or they are inert, can therefore be understood through Lakota embodiment and help one understand the bridge between the ceremonial and non-ceremonial worlds. The use of these objects in performance and dance illustrate the blurred lines between communication with non-human and through the non-human and the necessity of the human body in the creation of art itself and the understanding of any kind of knowledge. Key to embodiment is context provided by the land, cosmologies and the non-humans on that land. In author Jim Cheney's concept of bioregional ethics, Cheney writes, what has emerged is a conception of bioregional truth, local truth or ethical vernacular bioregionalism can ground the construction of self in the community without the essentialization and totalization typical of the groundings of patriarchal culture, end quote. The land and its non-human inhabitants speak clearly to humans, and not in a metaphorical sense, but in the clear communication of values and extreme depth of knowledge made clear by place itself and our intimacies with it. These contexts are entwined with embodied knowledge and the possibilities of ethical creation of embodied knowledge. I became interested in these Lakota symbols after a long drive with my cousin uh, by marriage, Mary Bordeaux. We were driving uh, back to Rapid City one night in 2018 and I was installing a piece at her gallery, Racing Magpie. She began telling me uh, about a man who came into the Red Cloud, Cloud Heritage Center. He had looked at an artifact, a decorated shirt, which had these Lakota geometric designs on it, and said he could, quote, read the shirt. Until that point of this conversation, I understood these symbols had legible meaning and they were symbolic, but I did not understand that they could be read like language. After discussing the process of making these designs with my aunt, Becky Redbow, 
I understood that to create these designs, first you must have the vision or the dream, be it the waking dream or the sleeping dream. They are not separated in my language. Only then can that dream be translated into the design. Similar to reading and writing music, these designs have the potential to communicate concepts without verbal language. In traditional Lakota art making and design, quill work and beadwork designs can be read as this semiotic language. While Lakota visual culture is not entirely gendered, generally men create figure drawings of things like horses, peoples, beans. However, women create geometric designs connected to dreams and visions. In an interview discussing Lakota design and visual sovereignty, I spoke with Sadie Redwing about her research in a recent book interview for um, a book called For Zit Kalasha. I ground this research methodology in Red Wing's Lakota geometric shape kit to form new designs based on that research and compose those designs as scores to be interpreted by musicians. When we as Lakota people look at beadwork and quill work, there are stories in the artwork. Inside those geometric designs, if one breaks those designs into design fragments and then into ideograms, one may see that what may seem normative to the Lakota uh, is very different from Western forms of communication. This the semiotic language verges into a form of ideogram or proto language. While visual Lakota culture was not entirely gendered, it's really important to remember that these dreams and visions are required for the creation of these designs. Red Wing states, I started to ask many questions. Why do we have designs on a pipe bag if it's specific for a man? And how do we document events through beadwork if we're only doing it through winter counts, drawings, or ledger art? And then why does a symbol remind us of something? Does the design on the bag help the pipe carrier to remember the prayer that they're going to speak? That prayer might be specific to them, so they might create a pattern or a symbol or a family history that it's documented on. It's how we document to remember. On the status of these symbols as language, Red Wing goes on to say, we didn't have written language because we really communicated through symbols and that symbols could either be for our documentation or recording or to help us remember war or beautiful events like wedding ceremonies or whatever it may be. It's not like the alphabet. There's a more oral history in remembering. We have a lot of respect for that. It's not like typing the ABCs. These ideas are connected to the term visual sovereignty proposed by Jolene Ricard and how concepts and symbols move across the plains in relation to other nations. Red Wing sees visual sovereignty as a result of the systems Lakota people have designed to reflect reciprocity and enact specifically Lakota epistemologies and ethics. Red Wing says, what are we designing towards decolonization? You may take away our prairie, and there goes our language. There goes our dyes, our foods, there we go. We had a system of keeping that life. It's a design system, it's an operating system, it's a functional system. That is why we follow the buffalo, because we knew the buffalo didn't overwork the soil. That is why we follow the buffalo, because we knew the buffalo didn't overwork uh, the plains. It kept the grass high, tall grass, Tall grass helps clean air pollution, just as trees do. People forget design is more than just designing a magazine. Why do we structure our tribes so that we follow the buffalo so we could keep our reciprocity going? <coughs> Red Wing argues the way the messages move through the design is important as well. How does this design get passed and carried? These visual scores can be a form of experimental music notation. 
read and re reinterpreted again and again and again. These Lakota geometric designs fit well for me as a form of score reading, where there's an original set of ideas that's attached to the symbols. They don't have to be explained or verbalized in language. Explanation or verbalization is not necessary for meaning to remain present or permanent. The interpretation can change each time it is performed and can develop interpretations over a lifetime, just like stories. The scores do not have to be trapped by the original interpretation. Linguistically, these symbols uh, could be ideograms, but not as simple as characters. Each is pictographic, bearing resemblance to the object it represents, but in a design dictated by 90 degree and 45 degree angles required by the physical properties of quill work and then later beadwork. These symbols can also be combined into semantic compounds such as cloud plus light, lightning equals thunderstorm. Visual scores are symbolic. They do not require language. They only require vision or dream and the creation of them. Red Wing's methodology points to a generative system of knowledge creation. Her work is especially important as she communicates both the macrocosm and microcosm, the possibility of ethical Lakota methodologies usable and communicable in the present on a large scale designs like the prairie itself and on small scale designs like a beaded medicine bag. Lakota art forms practiced today communicate this visual and philosophical sovereignty by enacting values of relation. Lakota beadworkers still maintain a connection to the spirit of double woman, drawing from visions and dreams to create their work. In uh, author Helen Wallert's Bead and Vision, Walking Dreams and Induced Dreams as a Source of Knowledge, she writes, Dreams and visions still play an active part in Northern Plains craft making and fully participate in elaboration of decorative designs. This is a process in which the mythical figure of double woman plays an important role. However, the social purpose of dreams and vision sharing is largely diminished by the transformation of familial and cultural ties, end quote. Interviewing an anonymous woman, Jane, Lakota artist, Jane says, I am like a widow, mourning for the suffering of my people who still ever live under oppression. In that state of mind, I cannot work on my beads. I can only fast, pray, and visit our different ritual sites, end quote. These visions deeply affect the artist, giving her a supernatural ability to work, but sometimes preventing her from working for need to pray. By invoking double woman, a mythological being, even though she is living a life of isolation and commitment to her artwork, Jane is in relation to generations of double woman followers, generations of Lakota bead workers, and remains in relation constantly to the unseen spiritual world. As Jolene Ricard writes in Visualizing Sovereignty, the seminal 1995 essay, Artfully deployed within indigenous communities, traditions are a reinvestment in a shared ancient imaginary of self and a distancing strategy from the West, end quote. Dreams and visions are an ancient technology, a tradition which understands the self in relation to the seen and unseen world, with artwork, in this case beadwork, as the mode of communication, and in this case, images of double woman. For Lakota societies solely comprised of relations, beadwork and artwork are made as gifts. Everything can be a gift and everything should be a gift. In the accurate narrative description of Dakota society, the novel Water Lily, Elicar Deloria writes, quote, as far back as I could remember uh, and they could remember, they had been made to give or their elders gave in their name, honoring them until they learned to feel a responsibility to do so. 
Furthermore, they found it pleasant to be thanked graciously and had their ceremonial names spoken out loud. For giving was basic to Dakota life. The idea behind it was this. If everyone gives, then everyone gets. It is inevitable. And so old men and women preach continually. Be hospitable. Be generous. Nothing is too good for giving away. The children grew up hearing that until it was a fixed notion. A relatively foreign concept to our hyper-capitalist contemporary Western societies, artwork for the sole purpose of gift-giving remains outside the logic of the economy which surrounds the Lakota today. However, Lakota artists continue traditions of gift-giving, a Lakota technology itself, which constantly reinforces the most important value of generosity. Through Lakota traditions such as beadwork, contemporary artists maintain sovereignty itself. For Lakota society, beadwork and artwork are only made as gifts. Everything can be a gift. Everything should be a gift. But where does this artwork come from itself? What is the good way of creating? When we make new knowledge, who are our collaborators? Do we communicate with and through our technologies to the other world? Does all of space and time conspire for our spirits to see a star or meet a stone? Are we listening to non-humans? These graphics illustrate conceptual frameworks which are ancient, developed in conversation with Lakota family members. If you, if you imagine a dome as a framework a dome holds the earth and the stars, the knowable and the unknowable, the physical and the metaphysical. An act of creation floats in the center. Imagine seven lines coming out from our sweat lodge where we honor the four directions, the heavens, the earth, and oneself. The kapemni, which is two triangles meeting in the center. That is the twisting vortex which shows the lightning strike of transformation, ideas from the other world meeting ours, two mirrors colliding. We must give thanks for these. We must feast our technological tools, seeking always to give more gifts than we receive. The Kapemni connects the macro and the micro, the maintenance of relationships with the physical world and beyond. Lakota cosmology scape is here in the now where the time scales of the stars and the time scales of our volcanic sacred sites are mirrored, stars and stones in an ancient and future dance. Lakota artist and elder John Duane Gozen Center speaks of Lakota Fairburn agates, a type of stone. One cracks open and sees swirling colors, layered bands of uh, minerals on the inside flowing with color, colors half a billion years old, testament to the uplifting of our sacred black hills and evidence of our story, the great race, which tells of how Eon rock in their great loneliness bled dry to create the world. Gozen Center tells me, quote, I know stones have healing powers because they were part of creation. These metamorphic rocks traded energy and matter, condensing into this thing with powerful energy. I revere them very much. Let's return to the sphere. Each node of the sphere that we are imagining are points of listening, hearing, exchange, reciprocity, acknowledgement, gifting, feasting, and honoring the knowable and the unknowable. As my friend Anishinaabe artist Scott Vanessa Bandan tells me, I consider dreaming the most important technology. We have because it weaves together one day to another day, one idea to another idea, end quote. Listening to the unknowable is a listening to non-humans, a listening that requires understanding the non-humans are beings in the present, listening to how they make their knowledge and reflecting those frameworks and how we as humans create something new. The following is a quote from a book called Sharing the Gift of Lakota Song. Quote, 
There are two kinds of songs, songs made by man and songs that come in dreams or in visions through the spirits from Wakantanka, the great spirit. Of the first kind, there are songs made by the mind of man to please the ear. Then there are songs to express feelings and to arouse feelings songs to stir men to brave deeds to give strength and battle and songs to make strong the heart to meet danger grief and death songs of the second kind come from wakantanka and are wakan they are holy apart no man has the right to sing such a song save him to whom the song came in dream or in vision but this man may teach the song and give them the right to sing it all songs that are holy, that belong to sacred rites and ceremonies, that have the power to work wonders that go with healing, are of this kind. Far holy rites, wisdom, and healing are from Wakantanka. Everything that has life has spirit as well as fleshly form. All things have nagi, soul. Rocks and animals have the power to appear in the form of man and to speak to man in dream or in vision. It is from Wakantanka that they have this power and wisdom. Speaking to John Dwayne Gozen Center, I asked him, are artists vessels? He responded, I've heard it about spiritual leaders. They always say they're a hollow bone or a vessel that creator power comes through. And you know, I know that I'm really happy when making things. In my dreams, I'm looking at my engravings, my cutters, just moving through metal, and I can just see things moving, end quote. Scott Benison of Andan told me, quote, you carry the language with you and you carry the dreams that you have with you, right? You dream in that vernacular, that, so it belongs to you. So the dreams connect you to the space and the place and the languages are the way that you can express it in the best possible way. And the manifestations of those things, the dreams and the language is the materials that you picked up along the way. That's sort of also rooted in place that you are. It takes the color and space that you're in, but the root of all of that is the dreams and language that you're thinking through, end quote. Double woman. Her complex supernatural beinghood represents a set of dualities linked to womanhood itself. Double woman is the inventor of quill work. She is the source of artistic talent among women. She's the benefactor of women artists and quill working societies. Thus, the double woman's dangerousness is expressed by the fact that a bead worker could easily lose herself and her mind if she let herself be influenced by the wrong side. Cousin, come back now. Someone here is waving a shawl at me. Cousin, come back now. Someone here is waving a shawl at me. Oh. 
Look at their tracks. Someone here is waving a shawl at me. Cousin, come back now. Someone here is waving a shawl at me. Tamahel, which can be defined as in one's mind and in one's thoughts. Tamahel in one's mind or in one's thoughts or within or inside the body, on the inside, in one's heart. If used in a sentence, it could be used as within my heart I wept continually. Or Tamahel, in my heart I am Lakota. Thank you, Kai, um, for this really beautiful and really poignant uh, performance. Um, it's a long narration that you've done, uh, which must be really exhausting for your throat. So we'll keep this um, <laughs> conversation informal. Um, drink as much water as you can. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you to all our viewers who are staying with us. Um, I'll start the conversation um, in the Q&A session now, but 
just a gentle reminder um, to already type questions <clears throat> in the Q&A bar and we'll, we'll try to cover as much. Uh, we haven't had any questions yet, but maybe I can just start for now. I think um, to start, um, you know, there are several, several terminologies that you use and I'm mindful for our viewers who, who may not know its meaning. Um, could you share what uh, as epistemology, ontology and, and non-human means to you and if you're comfortable to kind of elaborate on it in regards to your practice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, okay, so I'm in, I'm about two weeks away from submitting my PhD dissertation. So this is all very, um, you know, swimming in my mind and I'm like redefining these things all the time. But right now, ontology uh, to me is a uh, beinghood. So that's not shared with other people's definitions of ontology. This is really specific to my practice. So to me, ontology is, is who gets to be a being, um, what is being in itself. And that is, has become very different um, definition for me uh, outside of Western philosophy. So epistemology and I think about um, ontology as like the groundwork and who is a being, what is beinghood. Then epistemology is knowledge. How is knowledge created? Who gets to create knowledge? Um, what is knowledge? Uh, how is knowledge transmitted? And then, um, uh, and then I move, and I'm thinking of these as spheres. So those that sphere I spoke about is this sphere. And then we have this layer of the sphere of methodology, and that's the process by which things get made. And that's where ethics can enter um, as they don't enter, they emerge from the ontology and from the epistemology, and then they become part of the process uh, of the creation of new knowledge, which is which is methodology. So in, in to return to the ontology part, non-humans are in, from the Lakota perspective, uh, any being outside of me as as human, and the thing with uh, Lakota ontology is there are you, you can imagine the sphere half of it being in our world and half of it being in the unseen world in the spirit world. So there's an entire unseen realm of non-human beings which we may or may not interact with over the course of our lives. And those things are, are, are sacred. They're waka. And waka, in my current um, uh, practice, I, I don't consider it good or bad. Uh, spirits are neither good nor bad as a whole. Um, but uh, they can be communicated with and they can be collaborated with in order to make artworks. Thanks, Kai. I, I see some questions coming in, but... Maybe I'll just um, continue a bit more. Also, um, understanding that the visuals and you know, the designs that we just saw also derived from, from Lakota practices, as um, some of our viewers may be rather unfamiliar with these traditions. Can you share with us, if, if you're okay with it, more about the visuals we just saw? Yeah. Yeah, so um, the kind of uh, short answer um, is that those designs are really common on on like quill work and beadwork bags, so like traditional traditional stuff. But um, the design you saw in the performance at the end, as it all came together, is uh, I took the shape kit, which is just like the shapes but not put together, um, and I I actually just threw them down. I've never done this before, like aleatoric style scoring where I just threw them down on the counter and I and then I the order was decided for me and then I put them in the order I wanted to try that and uh the it's almost like reading tarot cards or something that's not normal that was just a weird thing I decided to do normally so um I'm so pale in this light. uh the uh like my aunt um would describe to me that she would get her designs she would just it would just come to her like a lightning bolt or um, she would dream about it and then and then make it and and so that's what I'm referring to with those designs and so like the, the one that we saw in the video 
it's got like a star of knowledge in the center or the four directions. It's got mountains, actually. It's got dragonflies, or which we think of as spirits. Um, it's got uh, the capemines, the twisting vortexes. Um, these those triangles. So that's what it's. That's what we're looking at. Ooh, that's great. Um, I think there's there's a question that's coming on, but I think maybe this could make a link as well. Um, I'm also quite curious. You know, you shared extensively what the Fisher score is um, about in the performance. You've narrated it. Um, I wanted to ask why the medium of a visual score for this. Um, I can assume quite sacred symbols. Um, could you take us through the thinking also about um, generating the visual score? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll start by saying that the, the question in all of this is, are they sacred? Like, I, I'm not sure how that's, I'm not sure that's in my power to know. I don't think so. Um, I don't, I don't think contemporary art is necessary. It can be, or very rarely is. It's, uh, but that's an, but it's an interesting question, um, which I ask lots of people about and the, but I do know it's still a collaboration with non-humans. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so for this project, I was really wanting to work through a question that's been on my mind for a while, which is what is a Lakota film ontology? Like what is being hood and what is not, and who is making knowledge when we, if I'm trying to make a specifically Lakota film? And so for this one, I think I was driving and it suddenly realized that it would have to be a, a very like visually um, reflective film. So like chiastic is a term where there's something in the center and it's enfolding in and out. And I, and I attempted that with the, um, with this uh, format, but I think the form here is quite malleable. I could have rearranged it and we might've had a similar effect. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to see if it, if that like format of storytelling visually, like what that would do. But I'm a maximalist and I just can't not talk about talk academic stuff. So I love to do that. And I was like, I don't want to just watch it the whole time and score it. I want to I want to talk over it the whole time. So that's what I did. But it might not need that. I don't know. <laughs> I think also um, someone asked a question. Um, I mean, they asked, I'm wondering if Kite can say more. I think this is also in relation to what we, we were just talking about. I'm wondering if Kite can say more about her own semiotic, semiotic language and how she relates it to musical notation as a practice shifts between visual art, music, and live performance. Yeah, I, I think this was this film I made was a um a, a trying to be a concerted concerted effort to not make kind of a random collage I've realized this year that I I think I'm actually a collage a col I've, I've I've been writing this PhD so I haven't had time to research like collage theory but I I always sorry I can hear this cat screaming sorry Leonardo please I'm on the phone uh he's hungry uh he okay so I have realized that what I do is I take um when I make a new performance I like get all of the music I've made recently I get all of the instruments I'm working with I get all of my phone recordings like audio recordings and then I get all of the things I'm depressed about or angry about or excited about and I shove them into one performance so for this one I wanted to acknowledge that I want to do that really badly and but then specifically take only four things that come to mind so for this one I'm I'm saying that the score is are the designs that I threw down it's okay that's the score and then I said each symbol I'm going to assign um, of an obsessive thought. Are obsessive thoughts visions? Maybe. Do they come from my brain? Probably. Do they come from the spirit world? I don't know. The, but 
and put those assign them to a symbol and then um and then get the i have these four instruments this is my voice um wind chimes uh a wind tube which is basically just a corrugated tube and um and then put them all together and you know and and then decide how they're going to what order they're going to go and i just did them in timeline order thanks kai um i think also going to this um discussion on on performance as well you know as an artist who is rooted in in performance and in time based medium especially while looking into um indigenous ethics and and its relationship with the non human um including as you say um ai artificial intelligence could you share with us um you know your chosen mode of working um that is with screen technologies um how do you see it as a way to continue telling this ancestral stories and knowledge systems um and maybe how do you see it as a potential to be continuously engaged in this ways of being yeah yeah i you know in this very intense time of revising my phd i've realized that even even now like i i care about ai less and less and less because but i think it's a good thing because i i think i've started to see it as part of the pantheon of technological tools and potential beings like i think we're surrounded by potential beings and it doesn't and it's and my viewpoint is that lakota ethics tells me that it's not up to me to decide who is a being and who isn't a being who deserves respect who is a human it's not my that's not my job that comes that definitely comes from elsewhere soul i can't give someone a soul i could never give a computer a soul if it's going to come from somewhere it's going to come not from me and um, i wouldn't i wouldn't dare claim that much um power so uh when i look at ai and its potential intelligence or its potential having a soul it, it doesn't matter to me anymore i should treat everything with respect so when i think about any technology i try to think of it through that construct i mentioned as um with and through so objects that are made by humans i can communicate with them potentially if they want to um and through them with so using things like i mean facebook's a great example native people love facebook which just it's just like the most the it's really the center of the universe and and it's a great I, it's a great technology because it's you use to communicate through and the reason we all use it so much is because it takes low bandwidth to use the messaging system so if you don't have internet you can still kind of get get have friends and family but it's just a tool with and through so same so now i think of ai like that just a tool i'm performing i'm using handmade things handmade computers you know assemblages of things with and through Okay. Um, I think also going back to the scope of this this program um, series that speculates um, skills of the future, right? And with your performance uh, mediated through a screen uh, over Zoom, with 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 most of the audience being on the other side of the wall, uh, I wanted to hear from you as well. Um, you know, what is your take in this experience of the virtual space? Um, and and you mentioned also about the relationship with the body. Um, what is that relationship and that is maybe built or derived um, from your way of being um, and thinking, if you're comfortable to share, of course. Yeah, I think, I think the screen, the screen is kind of a new tool for me because I went to school and basically only thought about listening for a real like a decade, and um, I still. I basically can't get away from considering all tools, including the screen and including the body as listening tools. You know, they're um, and not in terms of orality, like in terms of a perception of sound, but in terms of like um, potential for uh, moving knowledge. So I think the screen like that, I think of 
Zoom and tools like um, for transmission similarly. Um, and I, th I think about AI like that, you know, it's the, everything is just a tool for listening and communication potentially. Thanks, Kate. Okay, so um, I'm going to open the question to the floor. Uh, so we have about four questions. Um, are, are we good to go? Kate? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've got a question uh, who asked, uh, how has your creative practice contributed to understanding your own personal identity? Yeah, um, I consider art practice as the tool for asking questions um, that I'm afraid to ask. So, you know, if I am haven't spent a lot of time with a family member, I find I get a commission. I use it as an excuse to call them and make something with them. Um, I, uh, you know, I was until uh, my my PhD artworks, I was really kind of nervous to talk to people outside my family, like who weren't extended family members. Um, and so I used those artworks as an excuse to go interview people who I wasn't related to. Um, but it's really hard to like reach outside your community or expand the bounds of your community because um, I don't want to mess anything up. I don't want to be, be irresponsible. And um and so that helps me for, I think I've learned that Lakota identity is created through relationships and through relations and understanding how big our families are. And, um, and I think kind of the, the further outskirt I go onto the edge of my family, like, you know, um, cousins by marriage and like, you know, extended, extended, like the the more I can feel my identity forming, where I like I know myself more by knowing the reaches of my of my kinship. Thanks, Kate. Um, so we have second question who asked, um, looking at Google image search of Lakota, what is one thing that is not represented or depicted based on your understanding? I think if I if I do that Google search, I'm gonna get like a totally skewed um, thing because because of my search history, uh, which I think is funny. Um, I wish I could show you all what I I googled yesterday, which was I was just googling image Google image search Lakota. How oh, was it? Lakota song. No, it was a, it was like a Lakota prayer or something. I just wanted, I was looking for a specific quote and I was like, the only way I'm going to find this quote is through like really cheesy graphic design because it is amazing what, uh, look, what like Indian people do with graphic design. Um, it's just like really old school. And, um, yeah, so I think if you look at the, Okay, I'm looking at the Google image search. You know, there's a lot, it's everyone, it's like all these old men, all these ancient old men who are shown when like my vision of Lakota people is like tons of like women, women do most work in community and and two-spirit people, um, uh, people who are uh, queer people, they do mo tons of work in our community and keep the community going. And yeah, so I think if I, were to revise this search, it would look like people wearing basketball shorts. That's like the uniform of the world there. And um, and yeah, and women with uh, high like positions of power. Um, so, you know, with their blazer on and uh, controlling the tribal government and being more powerful than a lot of men, which is great. Okay, I've got a uh, question. A lot of artists who work with code or technology have a background in music composition. Do you see any parallels or any fundamental differences between computer code, music notation, and the symbolic Lakota dream language? Yeah, that's really interesting because I was just looking at, um, I haven't had time to do a linguistics deep dive, but I think what part of my next research projects will be 
to work with a linguist who studies proto languages. And I know there's like there's there's linguistic categories like code isn't considered. I, I can't remember the term like a, a, a verbal language because it or because it can't. It's not a natural language. That's the word. It's not a natural code is not a natural language. Um, and natural language processing, as we know, deals with natural language. Like, but I think that Lakota semiotic language, or whatever you want to call it, is so interesting to me because it it seems to me to be kind of outside those bounds because it's technically a synthetic language, but if it's been around for thousands of years, how can how can it be a like? How can we know that it's fully separate from the uh, the natural processes of a Lakota brain? Um, you know, I think our people, if our people are able to dream in that language, then isn't it a different category altogether? I'd have to ask a linguist. But the thing that really interests me is that it it seems to skip the need for verbal language altogether, and that's where it becomes very interesting to me and that's where it's similar to uh, I got music notation is considered a synthetic language too but if you talk to any musician like if you're really a musician you end up dreaming in that language you can I, I've dreamt whole compositions with all the parts already like it's like in it and if you ever played music while trying to talk you can't do it because it's using the same part of your brain unless you really train yourself um yeah, it's very difficult to uh, to do two at once unless you make it muscle memory. So, and then the next question, um, the next uh, the viewer said, "Thank you for the performance and elaboration of your practice. You you've spoken about symbols and designs as language, but what about spoken um, or written language itself? How have you positioned this within your performance and in practice?" Yeah, actually, I think um, I used to not have any spoken language at all in my work, but now it's become a crutch because I end up producing so much like academic style language that I like need it to, I don't have, I can't be awake 24 hours and I can only make like a little bit of time. I made this this week. So for example, like I shot it last week in Portland with um, some friends who had nice cameras. And then I came back and I sorted through quotes and kind of unpublished um, things. And I just made sure it wove together. I wrote some poetry to go with it. I researched songs. So the 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 text, again, it, see, that's what I did again. I, I'm, a, I'm a collage maker. I collage the text together. Um, uh, so that's kind of my approach to everything is collage. And then we have a last question from the viewer, which um, they say has, this has been so fascinating. Um, how does the Lakota community take to your work? Is there an awareness? I don't think, I mean, the thing about Lakota people is like, I don't want to say everyone's an artist, but like everybody's an artist. So there's a lot of artists. Um, I think I have to, like I lose, okay, so I went to art school and I always lose competitions on, in my community. Like I don't, I never get into things and that's fine with me because I have an art career, it's separate, but I think it's telling that um, sometimes I can be a little too, uh, you know, inaccessible. But I do, I mean, one of my favorite experiences was I uh, I was presenting at this gallery in downtown Rapid City, which is kind of the big, the big city um, near my community. And um, I, it was a, there was a crowd there that came to see the performance I was doing. And I had an, an aunt there, but she, she had forgotten she was my aunt. So she didn't know she was related to me. She just thought she was showing up and she gets in the room and she's point. I had all the poetry um, and all the quotes I was using listed on the walls and she's pointing at them. And she was, she's like, that's from this El black elk speaks. That must be a dream you had. That is that. And that is that. And, and I was like, 
Yes. So I knew that, but then I presented it in like Austria and people asked me like insane questions. They didn't understand at all what I was doing. And that showed me that I was on the right, right track. I'm not always on the right track, but at least that time I was legible, super more than legible to my community. And then I was like, Hey, actually you're my aunt. And she was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah, thank you so much, um, everyone, for your questions. I'm, I'm mindful of time as I'm well aware that um, Kite is functioning in central daylight time and should probably need to rest up for the day. So uh, again, Kite, thank you for your generous sharing. Um, but I do have one last question for you, you know, and you probably get this question a lot uh, considering that you talk about futurity and what it means within your practice. Um, what does the future mean to you, especially in this in these times of um, uncertainty as we move into a post-COVID world? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm in the Initiative for Indigenous Futures, which is a grant-based um, grant, grant body in the, out of Montreal, Quebec. And so, you know, I've been contemplating what the future is for about five years now to me and it, de it definitely changes I think today I am much more of an optimist than I was five years ago uh, before I started doing futuring workshops and like helping other people imagine the future because it, it is a challenge to imagine the future and it challenges us to be mindful of what um, Native um you know, North American people consider it seven generations. So we want to make decisions today that are good seven gener good for our seventh generations in the future. And that conceptual framework helps guide ethical decision making. So if I um, focus on that, then how can I be dystopian or how can I be negative because those people are relying on me my they don't have to be my blood seven generation kin but they can be my intellectual descendants my artistic descendants my societal descendants and that they I say I have responsibility today to do the best I can to use the tools I've been gifted today to to help those seven and I I try to try to stay there and, and it really does help um uh I also think that the that in indigenous relationships with um the land and the and the spirit world the land and the cosmos are extremely necessary for the survival of humans and non-humans on this planet and those are going to be the tools and the philosophies by that get us out of um western european uh, hyper capitalist greed so that is why I do it, what I do. Thank you, Kai. I think that was a very strong statement at the end, which I think we can all also agree with, um, especially in, in these times of um, the climate catastrophe that's um, upon us. Um, but again, uh, a big thank you to Kai for today's performance and for being so generous uh, in sharing um, your ideas as well. And um, Yep, I think we can we can wrap this up. So to all the viewers, thank you for joining us. Before you leave, um, we would love to know your thoughts on today's program. We hope you can take a moment to scan the QR code displayed on screen to access the feedback form. Your responses are very important to the design of our programs and we really do read them. So we hope that you take a minute to fill it up now. So goodbye and see you all again soon. Mm -hmm.